The Open Highway Podcast is a production of Viking Dog Entertainment. And now you can visit the all-new Viking Dog store for access to everything that Viking Dog has to offer. Movies, books, and apparel, including motivational lines, Open Highway merchandise, and exclusive wolf designs that raise money for wolf rescue organizations. So visit thevikingdogstore.com today. Support comes from the History's Trainwrecks podcast that focuses on stories like a temper tantrum that changed history, the president who promised not to run again and regretted it for the rest of his life, the World War II general who lost his pants on a secret mission in enemy territory. The History's Trainwrecks podcast, available now. And welcome to the Open Highway. Thanks for joining me today. A bit of a different episode. We have a theme today. That theme, because the world is trying to open back up, we're doing our best to get out there, see other places, meet other people, and maybe even enjoy a vacation. Today we're talking about travel. So sit back, maybe we'll learn a couple things as we hit the road on the Open Highway. So today we have Monica Arowski from Yampu Tours who's joining us. Hi, Monica. Hi. Hi. Um, So today we're going to talk about travel because uh, no one's been doing that that much the last couple of years. Um, It's changed a little bit. And uh, I wanted to chat a little bit about all sorts of things. I wanted to start talking about how are we moving forward? What changes are going on? now that people are really um, venturing back out into the world in full force? Well, the, um, the situation with travel changes every month. Every month I have new destinations that are open, other destinations that are closing, and new requirements. So it's kind of like a day-to-day. I'm taking a lot more last-minute bookings than I used to take before. Um, booking six months and a year out, Still, we should do it, but there's a little bit of trepidation. Um, But we've got some good news um, just in the last few days. Um, uh, The Biden administration, I think today, has decided they were going to open travel from, from Europe here, which will help because I feel like they kind of make it complicated for us because we've been not allowing them to come here. So I'm really hoping that that's going to um, soften up all the European countries. What I've been focusing on the whole two years are the destinations that have stayed open in COVID. Mm. So I've been focusing a lot on um, Costa Rica was open most of the time and they have great like um, great protocols. I mean, all the hotels are so clean and a lot of like naturally social distance because you're doing a lot of rainforest and and jungle tours and you know the casitas are located 500 feet away from the next one it's it's just it's just organically a great place to go right now costa rica mexico super easy they've been open the whole time um you know so you can go to mexico um kenya um has been one of my favorite destinations during the covid because again Once you get to those safari lodges, you're just in nature Mm. and really just everything just melts away from your heart and your (laughs) mind, you know? So it's really great. Um, I've also been, you know, focusing a lot on Turkey, Croatia. Those those countries have been open a lot of the time, especially Turkey's been open a lot, but Croatia's pretty good. Dubai's been pretty good. Um, Jordan, Egypt. Um, those have been pretty good destinations for us right now. We do have countries, though, that still have quarantines, though, when you come in. I know Australia still has a quarantine. Forget it. Australia, New Zealand especially, is off the list for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Asia, have been hoping they will open. They kind of toy with me a little bit. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Thailand opened one island. You know, uh, Vietnam talking about opening one island. I've got guys that want to do these adventure trips. They want to take motorcycle rides across Vietnam and go to 
you know, the Kochi tunnels, you know, and um, it's just uh, very complicated Asia right now. So yeah. um, let's wait six months and hope for the best for Asia. Uh, but New Zealand, forget about it. Maybe Australia next year. We'll see. But now's the planning time. Now's when you can get all your planning done and know know exactly what you're going to do. And and like I, the motorcycling across Vietnam has always been one that's been very appealing to me. Um, I saw them do it on Top Gear, and ever since I saw that, I was like, oh my god, this looks so much like such a great experience. Yeah, Vietnam is a great guys trip place. Um, I, we've done, um, you know, you can go sleep in a cave. Um, you know, and you can do the uh, rainforest hiking, you can do um, kayak races, you know, um, you know, th- down by the sea. So there's so many fun things to do in Vietnam. Um, I, I, one of my specialties is guys trips. I, I like to do, you know, wild adventure. I really get them out of their comfort zone. Um, so it's, it's one of my favorite things to plan. Well, on the other side, so guys, guys trips seem like the kind of trips that you know they're they're always been they've always been happening they've always been going on but one thing that seems to be um newer is uh girls trips or women's trips or because in the past it was thought to be very dangerous for women to go on a trip by themselves and i still have female friends that are like "Eh, a little leery about that what's that like now has that changed no, um, women are big travelers. Um, I have a lot of solo clients that I do all their travel for. Um, I have done my own um, wellness girls trips with my friends. Um, but what I noticed about the girls is they're not willing to spend as much money as the guys. The guys really, you're kidding. Yeah. I, I, I'm, le- I'm legitimately surprised at that. Uh, well, it's, it seems, you know, uh, it, no, women are very. Um, you know, concerned that they don't want to tell their husband they're spending $7,500 to go on a trip. You know, they want to spend three, you know, where the guys, it's no problem for them. $7,500, $10,000 a guy, no problem. I, I don't know why that is. And maybe it's in my age bracket. Maybe it's different for the younger age bracket. I, I, that would be interesting to know. Um, but uh, yeah, because I can just put all kinds of fun things in the guys trip and they'll just, you know, they're happy, but The girls, they're, you know, they present it to their husbands and they, they, you know, the husbands go, what? (laughs) You know, uh, that doesn't seem fair. There seems something very askew about that. Well, the women will spend their money in shopping. So if I take them somewhere, they're not going to spend it as much in experiences, but they'll spend it at a different store. So it's not one number that reads 5,000 on their credit card. It's like a bunch of $700 charges. (laughs) (laughs) I do have, I have one friend who's a, a teacher and she will do, um, on during her summer, she spends the entire summer just basically traveling around the world. And, um, you know, she really, she'll send these amazing photos and it seems to be, uh, experience based. And I think that's something that we're seeing a lot more, especially the younger generation. It's more, yeah. not just about having the picture, but actually having the experience, uh, once in a lifetime kind of thing. Um, how, what are you running into with that? So um, that's kind of in my company um, ethos for like at least 15 years um, because I noticed when there started being a lot of tours that um, I really wanted people, for example, if they're going to Peru to see Machu Picchu, I want them coming home talking about the people, talking about the nature um, how how they liked they liked Cusco and they didn't realize they were gonna like Cusco. They love the food. They love the pisco sours. They're asking me for recipes. You know, I want it to be. Uh, and and also we do pack for a purpose there, so they can take things from home and give it to a community that needs it, and they meet the people, and that really like binds their heart to the people of Peru. Mm. Um, so that's kind of one thing that I like to do in all the trips is to, I want to make sure that everyone gets to know the culture. They get to know, they do interactive things, things where they're learning something, maybe they're learning to cook or they're learning to weave, or, you know, in Japan, we learned calligraphy. Like, it's really interesting. And we learn calligraphy from like a true artist, you know, somebody that 
that that's his specialty, you know? Um, I've come back and been obsessed with, from Japan, uh, making ramen. Uh, and, and I did a podcast um, with Jason Jepson, Depson where he, he does, we did a movie review of the ramen girl. And then I went and made the ramen myself. And it was just a, a really good experience. And I got that from my trip to Japan. You know, I came home with, I, I mean, I thought ramen was something you bought for 99 cents and added Exactly. Water. I was just thinking that exact thing. That's like the, the bane of the existence of college no, students. That's no, not. <laughs> that really good ramen. I mean, the, the broth takes several days. In fact, I think some um, Chinese and Japanese restaurants, when they do their, their different broth, some of those, they have a broth that, that they keep on forever. Mm -hmm. you know? They just keep adding to it. And it's this ongoing broth for years. So the broth itself is like an amazing uh, thing. So yeah, I mean, a lot of experience based um, things are what people are looking for. So for example, in Costa Rica, um, we have a farm where uh, people will, um, they, they breed butterflies. And so they'll let a couple of clients come and see their property. And it's like nothing I've ever seen. I mean, it's just basically a forest and they move this um, uh, screen that they screen around a tree where the butterflies have, have started um, their, uh, what is it called? The pulpa. Um, the cocoon. The cocoon, and they put the um, the screens around it, and then the butterflies, um, you know, just they they go through their cycle there, and then you walk in, and there's tons of butterflies, and then when the they've sold those butterflies because they send them to museums around the world, then they'll move the screens to another area in the forest. So um, the experiences like that, where you're meeting real people that have a business, not tourist business, they're not. This is not something that every tourist is seeing you know, uh, but they're real people and you're, and you sat, they sat down, they gave us a meal and they showed us how they make chocolate out of the cocoa that they grow on their farm. And those are the kind of experiences that I'm looking for, for people. Um, that's, it's not something you can just search on Google and find it, you know, I mean, you have to know somebody that knows somebody to get you in there, um, to meet real people, you know, um, and see what their life is like and what they're doing. And that, that's kind of thing that I'm always looking for in every country. That's the old saying, um, be a traveler, not a tourist. Exactly. That's the, the, the famous saying. Um, so so we all know that sometimes Americans have been accused of not being the best travelers in the world. The term ugly American does come around from time to time. How do you, um, do you talk to your, to your clients or people that you work with about how to be a better tourist, how to be more open in other countries um, and realize that they're representing their own culture as well as learning about a new one? Have you run into any of that? Every country that I sell, there's a section in the documents about local customs and norms. Um, and, you know, like, for example, I think it's the Thai that you really don't want to have you touched them with their feet, your feet, mm -hmm. something like that, you know, um, uh, in, um, Uganda, I believe it's illegal to walk across the street looking at your phone. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, in many countries, they're doing away with, um, single use plastic. Mm -hmm. So we will probably be sending out those clients, a water bottle or giving them a water bottle when they arrive in the country that they can take everywhere and then we get make sure that they have access to uh, good quality water to fill it up with at every place. Um, so yeah, we spend a lot of time on that, but I want to just address this ugly American thing because I, I think that's just maybe in Paris. I mean, <laughs> you know, where somebody goes in with those really, ugly, now tennis shoes are cool, but back in the day, you know, the women would go in with like a sweatshirts and sweatpants and, and, and tennis shoes. And that wasn't, you know, cool, you know, but I believe that around the world, most people love American tourists mm -hmm. because, as, and, and there's different kinds of the tourists. And I'm, I'm working with the kind of tourists that I believe everybody loves. Okay. My clients, they, they tip well, they all, sometimes they complain to me when I, 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 
I included the tip in Alaska for these guys. And they're like, we love tipping, you know? And I'm like, well, fine, give them more money, you know? Um, so they love tipping. And so everybody loves to be tipped. So, you know, that's an American thing. Most of the world doesn't tip like we do, right. you know? So, um, and then Americans will ask people about their lives. You know, my clients want to know about the guy. They'll go to their house and have breakfast with them if we let them, you know? Um, so uh, the American tourists are interested in the cultures. Um, they are, um, you know, they're generous. Um, they're most part, most of my clients are kind and they're not, most of my clients are not, um, they're, they are privileged, but they don't act it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, they're privileged because they're, they're, they're spending a lot of money for these tours, but they don't act it. I mean, they're, they're very genuine. Um, so I, and everywhere I go, like, uh, even like, um, you know, at times when, you know, some maybe people didn't like our president, people loved us, you know? So um, I, I don't think that's a, that's not, I don't think it's true. There are ugly Americans. For example, in Costa Rica, when I was traveling, I was feeling so safe in March. Some American family went through a party on a, on a beach that's not super populated. And then there was like a huge outbreak, you know? Um, so things like that can happen, um, you know, but the kind of clients that I'm working with, um, and in, in the tour, I'm a tour operator and little thing about that is that, um, when clients travel on their own and they just book a hotel and they're there to party, they probably behave differently than someone who's booked a tour. Someone who's booked a tour has, you know, guides every day. They have drivers, they have experiences, you know, classes, hotels, everything is booked for them. And um, so they're there to explore a country. Yeah. They're there to get to know the people and to see the best nature and um, cultural sites. Yeah, I, I agree with you about the, the other uh, other cultures wanting to know about Americans. Normally, I, I've traveled a bit in Asia and I was always being asked questions and it was always fun to answer. Now, some of the questions uh, take you back a little bit and you have to kind of stop and consider it. I don't, I stopped counting how many times people wanted to ask me about my guns. Like literally that was a question I got asked all the time. How many guns do you have? And I'm like, I don't have any. And they're like, don't all Americans have guns? I'm like, no, they don't. Um, when I was in Russia, they wanted to know all about politics. They wanted to know all about um, the president at the time. And, you know, they very openly wanted to discuss that. And they wanted to discuss their own politics, which actually yes. like blew me away. Um, as far as the ugly American thing goes, I, I agree with you that most people, um, when they travel, they're, you know, they're pretty good. The things that I always ran into were people who brought American culture with them and expected locals to also be the same way. Um, a famous one was I had a relative who went to Spain and flipped out because they couldn't get butter for their crab. And they were like, we don't do that here, but I can't have my crab without butter. She was an older woman and very set in her ways. <laughs> but um, usually it's, it's like we said a few minutes ago, be a, be a traveler, not a tourist, leave, leave stuff at home and experience, have new experiences. And if you're open to that, it seems you're going to have a much better time. And isn't that the whole purpose of going is yeah. to, to discover new things and yeah. have these new experiences. Cause you can eat at McDonald's at home. You can. Yeah. Sometimes, we, sometimes we encounter that, um, uh, we, I had an Indian group, a group of Indian, uh, how do I say that right? A group of people from India, but they were American, but they went to Argentina and they wanted to have Indian food everywhere they went. So I had to find Indian restaurants at every destination that they went to. And for me as a, a, a person who's planning a trip, you know, that's just a challenge. I didn't mind. Um, but some people, you know, it, I think it's good when they tell us in advance that we can just plan for it. There's no embarrassment. Um, my my brother-in-law, he just went, he was in Italy and he had this beautiful five course meal and he asked for Tabasco sauce. And the, uh, <laughs> no. they were having a fit. Oh, and I, and he 
he's he's a pretty cultured guy. I can't believe he asked them for Tabasco sauce. Uh, even domestically, don't go to Texas and ask for steak sauce in a steakhouse. They will. Really? They, <laughs> no, 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 no. I didn't know that. <laughs> no, don't do it. Um, I, I wanted to ask you a question about like, so I, I was lucky enough to go to, to, I used to go to Mexico a lot. Um, mm -hmm. And we, I had the pleasure of going to Chichen Itza. And at the time you were allowed to climb to the top of Chichen Itza. And I still have photos of, of, you know, the view and, and up there and able to get close and see this amazing architecture. And I've heard now you, that's not allowed. It's, yeah. it's all blocked off. Are you starting to run into more and more of these cultural sites that you're, that people aren't allowed to get as close to? I know some of them are religious sites um, uh, in Australia uh, Uluru, I think I'm pronouncing it right. You know, that's been changed for good reasons. They're all good reasons because it's to protect them. But yeah. what's been happening with that? Yeah, so um, they'll, they are starting to really, you have to go to like, if you want to really get up close and personal, you need to go to the ones that aren't that popular. Like, I think you can still get close to Koba, which is um, on the road between Chichen Itza and Tulum. Um, and I wonder if you could still get to touch Tikal in Guatemala. Um, I did when I was there, but you know what? I, I would need to check on that if you can still do that. Machu Picchu, which is the one that we sell the most, um, has put in a lot of restrictions. For example, somebody broke something with a camera, um, one of those uh, um, stands. Mm -hmm not allowed to take a camera stand to Machu Picchu unless you get some sort of special permit yeah. um, and so um, and Machu Picchu has also uh, really um, cut down on the amount of um, people that they let in every day and they've even uh, separated into different time slots so you know uh, if there's 2,500 people, those people are divided between four or five time slots and they go in during those and you have to have a permit. You have to have a permit to hike, hike all those trails that are above Machu Picchu. Um, so they are really, you know, doing their best to protect. And you wanted to, you were asking me about ugly Americans. I think the new thing is now the Instagram influencer, like those people get into trouble doing things with their cameras sometimes they even fall to their deaths and standing up in oh, places yeah. Yeah. perfect photo um so yeah there's actually i want as as long as we're talking about machu picchu maybe you can answer a question for me um it's on my list of places that i want to go every time that i i seem like i'm about to go there unfortunately something comes up it seems like, are there certain spots that you're allowed to take photos from? Because every time I see someone taking a photo of themselves and then they post it, they seem like they're in the exact same spot. So I'm wondering, are there only certain places where you take the picture or are they in front of a green screen and they never actually went down there and they're trying to pull a fast one? No. Do you know the shot I'm talking about? It's like the exact same angle. It's the exact same background. It's Well, obviously it's the background of Machu Picchu, but. So you can take a picture anywhere in Machu Picchu, but I think what you're talking about is right where the sun gate is. And this is where people who like the Inca trail come in through the sun gate. Mm -hmm. That's the best spot to get Machu Picchu with the mountains behind it. So um, I, and I've even sent people up there, like you gotta go up to Sungate and get a picture from there, you know, because you get the macro view of Machu Picchu from up there. Um, but you can go up Machu Picchu Mountain and get beautiful photos of 360 degrees from the tallest mountain in Machu Picchu. Uh, you can go up um, the um, Wanyu Picchu, which is a small, the smaller mountain. So if you look at a picture of Machu Picchu, there's a tall mountain on one side, that's Machu Picchu Mountain, and there's a smaller one that's Wanyu Picchu. So those are two treks that I add permits to for clients, depending on their hiking abilities. And... Um, and so you can get great pictures from both of those angles, but it would be different. The one you're talking about is from the sun gate. I, I, you haven't convinced me. I think I'm still wondering if it's a filter because some of these, I don't know. I don't know. No, Maybe I, no. I'm, a, I'm a jaded journalist at this point. I'm like, they look too much like, like the same shot. <laughs> Maybe. Have you done, um, 
what's the most extreme like you had mentioned the the um the vietnam motorcycle tour and some of those like what are the most extreme tours that you've done i wrote an article once on people who went to the arctic and some of these like very very extreme um tours there's one where they actually fly in uh no not fly in they actually they had a boat that went in and they dropped off props on the ice so you could do uh, specific types of photo shoots um on on the ice cap and some crazy things that i've that i've come across what have you what are the most extreme tours that you've put together well um let me skip around the world. Let's see. Um, in Japan, and this is an extreme in the way I think you're thinking, but the guys that I sold this to, it was an incredible experience for them. Some of them wrote back and said it was their best experience ever. Um, there's a kind of water, Shinto waterfall purification uh, meditation that you do under a water waterfall that's um, about 40 degrees. Mm -hmm. And um, so we had a Shinto priest go out to this waterfall with them. They all dressed up in white. They were taught how to do the meditation. And then they got under the waterfall and did this meditation together. And these are extremely successful people that have anything they want. Um, so to do something this different for them, um, that was very authentic. Um, I, they, they loved it. Yeah. And and, and since I did that, I've seen a lot of that cold water meditation is becoming big now. And I, when I did that, it wasn't so big here in the West. Um, so that's one like example of something. Um, you can go camping in Antarctica. Um, you know, that, that seems pretty extreme to me. Um, I have done it, one fun thing that I did for um, some guys in South Africa is you can... Um, take a helicopter up to the top of this cliff and it's the longest and I'm not a golfer maybe the longest par three or par something and you hit so you hit the golf ball off the mountain into the um, green and so that was pretty cool um, to do um, and then other extreme things let me think um you know, I have a lot of people that are looking for wildlife and um, we can have them sleep under the stars. We can have um, in um, Greenland, I mean, this is expensive, but you can get this big boat to go down where the polar bears are. Oh, wow. um, and I was quoting that for someone earlier, but um, the clients weren't vaccinated. So that went down the drain. <laughs> But um, so there's certain things like that where we can get, I had um, those same clients one time, we had them in Finland sleeping in a, um, you know what a blind is? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So up in the tree and you, you sleep up there and you wait for the wildlife to come. Um, so we had them up in there so they could see the wolves. Um, so that's really exciting. And um, yeah, so we, it, we just will do just anything you want if it's legal, you know, <laughs> we will find it and do it for you. Do you have domestic, do you do just international or do you do domestic um, excursions as well? I, during COVID, I had to pivot to sell America. Um, it's harder because the service is way more expensive and not as service-minded as, for example, if you're in Vietnam, like everyone's going to just take care of you, you know, or Peru or Argentina or almost any other country. Um, but uh, yeah, um, we pivoted. We're selling a lot of the West. We're selling Hawaii. We're selling Alaska. Alaska, especially, it would be a good person to place to use a tour operator with because it's complicated yeah. and it's very popular in the summer they have a very short season so you need to plan ahead um, and really um, you know focus on you know what is your athletic ability how comfortable are you with small planes what do you want to see what do you want to accomplish and get all those details and then book it early because Alaska fills up yeah so when you say west are, are, are dude ranches still a thing yeah so I a time during COVID in Montana. Everyone wants to be city slickers. 
I all watch <laughs> all the shows about Montana now. I started Big Sky a couple of days ago. Yeah. Um, and so Montana and Wyoming, Utah, um, uh, um, um, New Mexico. Uh, those are the ones that we've added and been doing a lot of work in those. We can do California, um, Arizona. Mm-hmm. So there's there's a lot to see in the West. Um, I've been to like so many places in the United States. I could probably put together just about anything in the United States. But we focused on the West because um, it was just a really good weather there for most of the year. Um, a lot of our clients are on the East Coast, so it gets them out to do something different. Yeah. Um, do you ever get, do you ever get calls when you're, you just have to go, nope, that you, no, sorry, can't help you. Um, well, right now during COVID, I have to say that to a lot. I mean, like my guys, I have my guys that want to go to Vietnam and they've been waiting because they were on their way when Vietnam closed, like on the plane and they got off to change planes and there was a big sign. If you're going to Vietnam, you're gonna to have to quarantine for 14 days. So I got up in the middle of the night and redesigned a Thailand tour for them. And so they've been waiting to go to Vietnam and I had to tell them no, oh. um, because it's just, I, I don't think it's gonna happen. But if somebody called up and they're like, I wanna wrestle a polar bear or something <laughs> like that. There's gotta be a line where you're like, no. Nope, yes. So I don't want to do anything that hurts animals. Fair enough. When I started the company, we thought it was cool to ride an elephant, you know, and that's not really, I mean, I don't really want to do that anymore because it's most, it's just not as ethical. There's better ways to do it. Now I'll say, why don't you go and learn to work with the elephant, be a mahout for a day, Mm. hike with the elephants in the jungle, you know? Um, so that's, you know, we've become a lot more sensitive towards, um, the nature and the creatures, um, that we are, um, exposing ourselves to. Um, so, and like when I, I, uh, there was a video that was circling of, um, somebody in Yellowstone who got too close, like we're walking out in the middle of where all the, um, the, what are they called? The big buffaloes the bison yeah the bison where the bison were and the bison i was just getting crazy over that like why is that tourist doing that you know um so i i want definitely we are protecting the people um and we are protecting the um uh environment like Mm -hmm. used to get some single guys that would ask me some funny questions and i'd be like no no oh really Yeah, but that was, I think, like 15, 20 years ago. I don't get that anymore, you know? There's, um, I'm going to wager a guess and and say, were they talking about Thailand and some of the... Um, you know, I can't remember. Um, I just know that a few times I've been a little bit skeeved out, you know, mm. of something about they might have said about women. Um, but I don't get that anymore. I really, like... Um, you know, people are becoming more sensitive when they travel, yeah. you know. Um, We've yeah. learned a lot about, like you said, like the elephants. That's a great example because now it's come out um, how the elephants are treated. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I, I had a friend who went to Thailand and, and learned a lot about, you know, they thought they were allowed to be wild and they thought they just loved being ridden. And then once they saw the chains and they saw the cuffs and some of that, yeah. some things have come out about, you know, swimming with the dolphins. There's a lot of controversy about how the dolphins in Mexico are treated at some of these places. You know, I know a lot of them are shut down, um, even down to like taking pictures with animals. You know? What? Even down to like taking pictures with the animals, you know, oh, I want to have this monkey, you know, sitting on my head or something. It's like people are actually asking questions like, how has it been treated? Is it, you know, is it a, you know, is it chained up? Is what's going on? Why is it? Doing? So I have a lot of pictures with animals if you look on my Instagram. Um, and you just have to be very careful of who you, where you are when you're doing that. So, for example, I, I mean, all over my Instagram are these three elephants I met in Botswana, and um, they have a fun story. I mean, an interesting story. They were um, at a rich family's house in South Africa. 
um, as they grew older and became teenagers, teenage elephants can be very naughty. And, you know, the elephant was like turning over cars and, you know, so um, they were about to be sent to a hunting camp and this couple adopted them and they took care of them for like 27 years, these three elephants, and they were semi habituated. So when we went to meet them, we walked in the um, bush with them. And we even had the guy with the gun because he had to protect us from other wild animals. And there actually was a water buffalo stalking us. No, Cape Buffalo stalking us while we were there. And um, so that was a little scary, but and, and we could interact with the elephants a bit, but it was very structured like, you stand here. There's a, a video of me with the elephant taking my hat off and I'm giggling, but the, I was told where to stand and I couldn't move. I had to stand in that one position and the elephant. And so the elephants would basically, they would come to us. Like we would position ourselves. So we weren't reaching out to touch the elephant. The elephant was reaching in to touch us. It, and this, these couples saved these elephants. I mean, they're, and they were treated really well. I mean, they were walking in the wild with us with no chains. Um, so that was an amazing experience, one of the best in the world. Um, and I'm proud that I have those photos, you know. Um, I do have work with a lot of uh, rescue centers that are really rescuing because there are, you know, when wildlife, it comes together with humans, um, There, there's a balance that need to be considered. So for example, um, a lot of times in South America or in Africa, or maybe even Asia, um, when, when the wildlife come into the farmers and they start destroying their livestock, which is, you know, in some places, your livestock is your net worth, you know? So when the animals start coming in, then there's like, they can shoot them or, you know, so then they need to be rescued and they end up in a rescue center. Um, and so that, those are the kind of places that it's okay to go in and meet some animals that have been in a rescue center, but the rescue center didn't go out to get those animals. The animals were brought in because right. they were hurt, um, you know. And so like one thing you could do to rescue animals or to give back while you're traveling is like, for example, if you're in Africa, you could pay to have a fence built around a farm uh, so that lions can't get in and eat this. It's, um, I think, oh, I'm losing my words. I used to know what it was. I think it's a boma, but they build it around and um, keep the lions out. Mm -hmm. And so you could do something like that. You, you could donate one of those. Yeah. Uh, and and that would be saving saving the lions it's uh it's it, when you're when you have the chance to interact with um i'm making air quotes but we're only audio so you can't see it but like a wild animal for example you know that i i i deal with wolf rescue yeah and i had the chance to go out to a, comp a group called wolf connection in california and they deal with wolf rescues so a lot of the times sometimes they're wolf hybrids that have been bred but a lot of times they're they're captured or they're wounded and when you're sitting there like you said with the elephants you do not go to them they come to you it's right. it's and if you try to go to them one they're not going to allow it and two it could it could go badly but when an animal comes to you and allows you to interact with it on its terms. It's a really amazing experience. I don't care if it's a wolf or an elephant or, or whatever. Um, so, but I can imagine you sitting there with a hat and just being like this 10 ton animal, oh, <laughs> yeah. like don't move. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I was laughing. It was very fun. And um, I've noticed that animals are starting to come to me more now. Maybe that I've opened my heart a little bit more. They're, they're coming to me more. I was in Mexico a few days ago and a donkey walked up. I thought the donkey loved me, but I think people feed it. <laughs> I just, I love the way you said, so I was in Mexico the other day and a donkey walked up to me. It's just like, <laughs> that it was a Tuesday. <laughs> Well, I was truffle hunting in, in Croatia last 
<laughs> the dog jumped on me. Like, it's just like something's <laughs> happening to me lately. I, I'm turning off the people, but the dogs and the, the animals are loving me. So I think there's more and more people that, that, that are the same way. <laughs> like, yeah. I'll deal with the animals. It's much easier to go. Um, how often do you travel? How often do you oh, spend on I, the road? I spend a lot of time, uh, probably at least six, eight, 10 trips a year. Yeah. How did you get into this? So um, I, uh, my husband, I met him in New York and um, I told him he's Peruvian. I said, I always wanted to go to Machu Picchu. <laughs> and um, so he had to go home for a month. So he took me with him. And we went to Machu Picchu and we loved it. And he was um, about to start a new business in New York and he was trained as a lawyer. And, um, but I didn't want him to become a lawyer in New York. I would never see him. We would have broke up. <laughs> and then uh, he also came from a shoe empire family in Peru. So um, he was thinking of starting a shoe business and the lawyer wouldn't let us sign the lease. So his third idea was a travel company doing what we did in Machu Picchu. So we started it together um, back then. And every year we would travel to a new destination, add that destination. And now we sell more than 70 countries. Wow. Now, how long is, how long has that been? 70 countries in 23 years, 23 years. Yeah. What were your first, so what's, what's the difference? So 23 years, um, what, have, what changes have you seen? What major changes have you seen in those two decades? What are the biggest ones you think you've seen? The biggest changes I've seen, well, what we talked about with the animal interactions really becoming a lot more um, clear about, um, you know, how uh, getting more into the details of who, where are we going? What are, what, what are the treatment of the animals? Um, so that's one. Um, experience, like we talked about earlier, um people want more authentic experiences people are um when i first started it was like thinking about a country like peru i want to go to lake titicaca i want to go to the amazon i want to see the machu picchu so it was more about the places like people were clicking off places you would research a country and you would find out what's in that country what are the most interesting places and you want to focus on that? Mm -hmm. It was all about logistics and focusing on um, getting them into every single place that they wanted in the right hotel and the right tours and, and, you know, and everything. Now it's way more experiential. Uh, I think that people might do less places and have better experiences in them. And I'm pushing people for that too, because instead of spending hours and hours upon hours in the airports and, you know, a lot of money on transportation. If you're in a really cool place, like for example, now I sell Patagonia, which is at the bottom of Chile and Argentina. And I sell that, I try to sell that region only because most, most of the time when we were selling Chile and Argentina, they're very long countries they are probably, I don't know, 2,500 miles long. And we're flying up, down, up, down, you know, all the way up north to south or south to north, you know. Um, and you spend a lot of time on planes and it's different, like it's hard on your body. Um, I did it in Chile. I went from Patagonia to Atacama, which complete sides of the, the continent and it's hard. So it's focusing on regions like Patagonia, like let's see Argentina, let's see Chile in Patagonia. And then you can do Chile and Argentina another time because people that I work with, they're traveling every year, like most of them at least two times a year. So um, they can come back to countries. You can, you can um, see more and get better uh, experiences and kind of, you know, just uh, instead of having to click off everything in one trip, just enjoy yourself where you are. That's, that's nice advice right there is just enjoy. Because remember the days there was a movie, I think I want to say it was a Cary Grant movie and I might be showing my age, but it's, you know, it was that whole idea of, 20 countries in 10 days or you know it was you were literally stamping your passport three or four times yeah. a day and i don't you don't hear about that anymore you don't hear about these speed tours yeah i mean much. we used to have we have on our website the south america uh, you know where you do um six countries in a month 
And I, I'm, I, I can't remember the last time I've sold that, you know? Yeah. Um, Even that's not that bad. Six countries in a month isn't, isn't well, that extreme. I don't know. I mean, there's so many cool things. And in, in Peru itself, I spent a month doing all luxury properties one year, you know? Uh, all luxury destinations and different places, you know? Um, in Chile and Argentina, um, a month would be great just to do the, those two countries. You'd probably do a month in Brazil alone. Brazil is huge. If you look at a map of South America, it yep. takes you off the map, you know? Yeah. It's a huge <laughs> part of South America. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I really... There's so many different, like, beautiful destinations in each of these countries. They, each of them, every country deserves a month. <laughs> <laughs> do you do educational ones? Like, I know you can do educational tours to um, to Cuba, for example. Yes, I've done Cuba educational tours and also um, the people to people. So we've, you know, gone there and set up um, a lot of, of um you know, you visit a community um, that is uh, rejuvenating itself through art. You know, we did that. Um, there's a lot of educational components that we can put into tours in almost every country. Hmm. We can do, uh, for example, um, we can do a lot of learning about conservation. I have so many places we can do that. Um, for students, we could do like, um, there's a place in South Africa that um, uh, uh, a girl went when she was 16. She spent a month there and now she's a vet, you know, mm. um, because she stayed at, and she worked on this um, place where they had kind of a rescue center and they were always rescuing animals and, and she was volunteering. So um, she really got like hands-on experience. Um, so we've done that. We can do um, going into the Amazon and learning about plants and um, uh, a lot about the uh, the biology and all the cures that you can get from plants and learning about um, you know the animals and and seeing how um, the cycle of life kind of works um, deep in the Amazon, uh, which is an amazing place to study the flora and fauna. Um, so you know that's very educational. Um, that we can do, um, yeah, I mean, we can do cooking tours, you know, we can go on a whole through Tuscany and learn to cook different kinds of food, or I think it would be fun to design a cooking tour in all of Italy, because each region has a, a different cuisine, and I think that would be fun, I've never designed that, but it just it came into my head as you're asking me, so. Do people come back, like you mentioned the the woman who became a vet, I mean, that mm -hmm. really jumps out at me, so I'm sure you, if not just repeat customers, repeat clients, you yes. have people that come back. I'm sure they come back and you contact them. Like, how was your trip? Did, you know, what did you, what did you learn? Did they come back with life-changing experiences that they tell you about? Or oh, yeah. the whole idea of the show is, you know, open highway is about learning and meeting new people, their backgrounds and learning about other ways of living. What do you hear from people? Yeah, so 90% of my clients are repeat and referrals. So I definitely get that. Um, I had these clients that went to Peru and they were optometrists and they went into the community that I took them into and they, um, they took classes and they adjusted them right there on the spot for the person's um, eyesight. And so they changed the life of 30 people. I mean, it, um, they, we had a client that was so touched in Uganda of how beautiful the people in the community was. He threw a party for the whole village. He went to the manager and said, I want to invite everybody in the village to a party. And he paid for all the whole village to come to a party at that hotel. Um, and, and I think that these experiences, it, I would assume they're changing their life. They're definitely changing mine because these stories just touch me in a way that um, really makes me feel like my life's work means something. Mm -hmm. um, uh, clients um, that lives have been changed, let me think. Um, um, I bet you that there's a lot of kids. I bet there's a lot of kids that go places. My daughter, she went, she, she was, um, 
she was having a little bit of a hard time and she went to Zambia. You know, th there's a lot of, um, you know, anxiety right now with young people. Um, social media is causing like a huge problem with young people. Also COVID, you know, being stuck at home. I don't know what kind of family situations people are in, but you know, a lot of young people are faced with um, problems right now. A, a lot of anxiety, the suicide's gone off the chart, right? So my daughter was going through a rough patch and um, she took a year off before college and she went to Zambia for a month and she worked as a teacher and she lived in very um, basic, I mean, spiders jumping all over and she hates bugs, spider jumping all over the room, you know, very uh, basic conditions she lived in. And she rode her bike every day to teach these kids. And then she rode back and then went to another uh, a center where kids that couldn't afford to go to school came and they, they tutored them. And she did this full time for a month. And um, on the weekends, they had off and then other people would be there and they could go on little excursions. You know, she, um, she went to Victoria Falls, you know, they went um, sunset on the, on the, not, um, the Zambia River, you know, my country's confused. And um, she came at the end, these kids wrote her a um, song and dance. And they did it for her. And that picture of her with those kids hanging on her and they're all smiling. And she came back and um, she's just doing so well. Um, she is uh, taking a spiritual road right now um, and learning about everything, spirituality, meditation, you know, uh, and how this, this, um, these things, uh, meditation and all this can um can combat anxiety yeah she's self-teaching her this herself this because she um hasn't found a program that will do it for her so she's self-teaching herself all these things and really changed her life and super motivated and well i'm a mom so mm -hmm. yeah you know, i'll stop gushing on about my no time. no travel <laughs> travel will change your life I, yeah. I i thoroughly believe that too many people are either afraid of it or don't think that they need it. I, if I, every time I run into somebody and I talk to them and they're like, well, I don't have a passport or I have never left my state or I know people who've never left their County. And, and it's, it hurts a little bit because I think you're shutting off a part of your life. You're shutting off a part of what it is to be a human being by not going out and interacting with other people and other cultures and learning what else is out there. So the internet can only do so much to, to connect with people across the world. You really should get out there and have that opportunity face to face to meet other people and learn about them. I'm not a big foodie, so I can't tell people to go eat food in all these other countries. I will admit that, but you know, when I was, when I was in Korea, there was like, try kimchi. I'm like, Nope, not going to happen. Oh, kimchi is so good for you. I know, but it's like, you know, but they have amazing the the meats and the steaks and the, uh, uh, the chicken. That was one of my favorite things about Korea. This is, this is my little thing to, to hand off to you to tell your clients. If you ever get to go to Seoul or go to even some of the smaller towns, they have um, chicken bars. Chicken. And they're chicken bars. It's basically like barbecued wings, but it's with the Korean style. You're starting to see them pop up in the United States. We have a couple here in L.A., and you sit there and you you eat chicken wings and drink Korean beer and you watch the <laughs> the the local soccer team with everybody and it's just it's the greatest experience. I got to hang out with the Korean national soccer team and just sit there in in Koyang and it was it was one of the greatest experiences of my life. You know, it's these types of things that shape who you are and shape your view of the world. You know, whether it's being in Seoul or being, I got to go to the Arctic Circle in Russia and I got to go to Thailand and Taiwan and, and all these different places. And I wouldn't be the person I am today talking to you about these subjects if I hadn't taken those opportunities. So I'm a big supporter of get, get out of your house, get out of your country whenever you can. So my yeah. little moment, it's my show. It's my little moment. So yeah. <laughs> Well, I appreciate your time um, spending with me. This was a great conversation. It was really fun to chat with you about all these different subjects. So one last thing, Yampu Tours. 
what is where does yampu come from the name i would be a bad oh. reporter if i didn't ask okay so when we originally started the company we named ourselves contiki which is um a book written by thor hedradile about a uh, um a boat that goes between Easter Island and Peru. And that boat, um, the one that they used was made in Bolivia, actually, um, on, in Lake Titicaca um, between Peru and Lake Titicaca's a big lake at 12,000 feet between Peru and Bolivia. So the boat was made there. I actually met one of the guys that made the boat. Anyway, that boat is a Yampu in Quechua. Oh, that's where it comes from. Mm -hmm. That's and, really cool. Yeah, we had to change our name because too many people were named Contiki. And there's also a Contiki with the C. And their company is very different from ours. And people were getting us confused. Mm -hmm. so it's something unique. So we wanted to keep the theme. So Yampu is our new name. Love it. But and it's where, 2008, so it's not new anymore. Wow. Uh, and where can people find you? I know you're on Instagram. I've already found your instagram feed and obviously the website uh, let me know where where can they go yeah so yampu.com y-a-m-p-u.com and um you can get in touch with me there um uh yampu has its own instagram and then i have my instagram um which is my personal experiences with travel um through yampu and so there's the two instagrams um we're on facebook um linkedin Twitter. Um, so we're, however you want to get in touch with us, you can just remember our name, Yapu. All the usual suspects, all the yeah. usual platforms. So Monica Orowski, right? Yes. Ah, so I'm going to say it again, just to make sure. So Monica Orowski, Yampu Tours, thank you for having this conversation and hanging out with me. It was fun. It was fun to actually just chat about travel and, and, and the world that's out there. So I appreciate your time. So thank thanks you. I appreciate in. you having me on here. Hello, great minds. Mr. DGMH here, but wait, what the hell is DGMH? DGMH, or Drinks with Great Minds in History, is a weekly podcast that covers one of history's greatest minds each month. While we enjoy review and rate themed cocktails, liquors, and beers on the scale of greatness. As greats like Alexander Hamilton square off against George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and more, DGMH is the perfect cocktail of history, sarcasm, and alcohol, with a twist of psych and a bunch of shots along the way. So grab yourself a drink with some great minds in history. Cheers! And here we are with Pat Smith who is the director of the Oklahoma Route 66 Museum, correct? Right. All right. Nice to see you. Nice to nice talk to, to you today. You today. How, uh, how are things in Oklahoma? Well, very hot and dry. <laughs> but you're busy right now. That's what you said to me earlier. Yes, very busy. It's really been a busy morning. Are you, are you reopening completely? Are you open every day of the week? How's that working? Yes, we are. We have reopened completely. We're open Tuesday through Saturday from 9 a.m. until 5 and Sunday 1 to 5. Is it great to be going again? It certainly is because <laughs> during my whole tenure here for the last, I guess you could say, 26, 27 years, this is the first time that we ever closed the place. Oh, wow. So do you still have, is, I've been hearing recently that, you know, road trips have been coming back in because it's an easier way to travel, not dealing with airlines and, and everything going on with that. Have you been seeing a larger number of people coming through town? Absolutely. Many, many American people are starting to travel the United States. They just seem like it's a better way to travel right now during the pandemic and we're having hundreds of people that are starting in Chicago and making the complete Route 66 trip to Santa Monica, California. In fact, just this morning, we're short-staffed and we've had at least 10 different couples that are doing that that have came in the museum. And when they come into the museum, are they just, do they, is it a destination or do they just happen to drive by it and be like, I have to go in there? 
Well, to many, it's a destination because the Route 66 Museum here in Clinton, Oklahoma, is actually the largest museum dedicated to the history and culture of Route 66 from Chicago to Santa Monica. So it is the largest history museum. It's the first, isn't it? The first state-sponsored museum, correct? Yes, it is. It's sponsored by the state of Oklahoma, and it started with the ice T federal funding Um the people here in Clinton, Oklahoma, ra raised numerous thousands of dollars, and then the Oklahoma Historical Society pitched in as well. However, we are pretty much self-funding. So it, you're dependent on people who come in and purchases, and yes, the gift, are, the gift shop we, always is important. You got yes, to have your I Route 66 shirt. everyone that comes in because they are keeping the museum open. Yeah. So, so how long has the museum been there? Well, it actually opened in September of 1995. Okay. So my goodness, I guess we're going on 26 years. So you've been there since the beginning or pretty yeah, close? Actually before the beginning, like three or four years before. So I actually helped with removing all the artifacts from the old museum that was here and helped with all the exhibits and uh, research for the new museum. So, so let's talk about the, the exhibits for a second, because when we spoke earlier, you had mentioned that you do it by the decade. Is that correct? Right. Okay. So, so if we're going back to the beginning, we're going back to the, to the late twenties, correct? Absolutely. Okay. So what, what is that? What exhibits you have that deal with the beginning of the mother road, the beginning of all of this okay well actually our museum tells the history like you said by decade our first room as you enter the museum is the introduction room and it just gets people that do not really understand about route 66 it shows them how it goes through the united states and gets them ready to actually uh, learn the history of the road our next room is the 1920s and of course in the 1920s there became a need for a federal highway to connect our nation. So um, Oklahoma's really on the map. Cyrus Avery from Oklahoma was a part of the commission that helped form Route 66. Um, Andy Payne, there's an exhibit about him. He ran a foot race that started in um, California and went all the way to um, Illinois. And he actually won the foot race and he was from Oklahoma and later put a lot of money back into the state. So uh, in the 1920s, it basically just shows how the road was built. Uh, we have artifacts that pertain to that time period, like the grader that was pulled by horses. It, it really makes us appreciate life today. So, so Clinton is in the, the western part of Oklahoma. Yes, it is. And okay. actually, Clinton, Oklahoma was the national headquarters until the very, very end of the road and even after the end. Okay. And uh, Gladys and Jack Cutberth from Clinton, Oklahoma, promoted the road on a nationwide basis. And when the museum opened in 1995, we had the New York Times reporter here and I actually took her to Mrs. Cutbar's house, Mrs. Route 66. So that so was quite an experience. That's the US Highway 66 Association, right? Yes. So that was really, that was really an organization that actually promoted Route 66 and worked to get it paved, worked to really bring it to life. Absolutely. And that was a Absolutely. huge organization. Yes. So what, how, what does that mean to Clinton? Like, to, what does that mean to this town that to be so connected to Route 66 and be such a pivotal part of the country? It just uh, makes it very, very important because many people all over the world knew that and would contact the Cutburst. And it was the national headquarters uh, for many, many years. And so um, this is one of the re reasons we asked for the museum here in Clinton and worked on getting the museum. It took actually 10 years to get it in place, um, but it just seemed like the perfect place to have the state museum. But it actually covers the entire history Many people think that it just covers the state of Oklahoma, but no, it covers Route 66 from Chicago to Santa Monica. So what um, the people that would be brought through Clinton, through the area, 
I mean, you, you talk about more recently, the New York Times reporter that came in to cover things, but this has to be a, a crossroads. It has to be a place where people from all over the country would come through and not only see what Clinton had to offer, what Oklahoma had to offer, but to share what they bring when they come through. Um, absolutely. You're absolutely what, correct. Tell, can you tell me a little bit about that or what you've seen or what you've... Absolutely. We've had people from all over the world, actually, that come to Clinton that actually knew <clears throat> that this was where the headquarters was for many years. And so they stop at the museum and they know actually more about Route 66, as you know, than many Americans. <laughs> and uh, so yes, people from all over the United States and the world are aware of this. And this is one reason they stop here in Clinton, Oklahoma. Why do you think, why do you think that Route 66 has become such a mythological thing? I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> There's nothing else like it. And it, it carries this spirit that we don't see in any other, well, definitely no other highway. I live in Los Angeles and I can tell you that the 405 is not a magical highway. Right. <laughs> what do you think? I don't know. But like you said, Route 66 is the most famous historic highway, not only in America, but in the world. And I think a lot of it is, it's an open road to the international visitors. They love to travel it because it's such an open road and they feel the open country as they travel. And also it's just the history of going through the little towns of a smaller, uh, slower pace of life, I guess you could say, the nostalgia of the road. Um, and then we have numerous, numerous young families that stop here because their children say, oh, stop at the, the museum. Uh, they remember the Cars movie. This has really inspired mm -hmm. a lot of the younger people. Okay. The Cars movie. I didn't think about that. I actually. So, so we talked. We we touched on the twenties. So the twenties and the thirties were sort of the beginning of when it Absolutely, happened. Yes. Then you have we we head into the forties. Obviously, World War Two. Right. And then after World War Two. The I diner would think there was another place. Boom. Yes, the nineteen fifties. The diner. Uh, the war was over, so many of the military families wanted to take their uh, children and wife on Route 66 and just go on a vacation. And this was really a vacation time. Uh, and this tells about the diner, basically, because during this time period, uh, ch you know, children were allowed to eat in restaurants. Before that, it wasn't really a main place for children and families to go to. But in the 1950s, it busted wide open with the beautiful neon lights, you know, at all the restaurants and the motor courts and tourist courts and Elvis Presley became popular and all the rock and roll music. So <laughs> when our visitors get to the 1950s, um, it's just it's such a heavy history of the road. So that's when we get into Pop Hicks, correct? Absolutely. So can you tell me a little bit about Pop Hicks? Because I'm sure many people don't know about yeah. it. Yes, Pop Hicks, the oldest continuous operating restaurant on Route 66, and it burned to the ground in 1999. And we're so excited here in Clinton because a man has purchased Roots, uh, the Pop Hicks and the Glassies Motel, and he is completely restoring them to their natural beauty, and they will reopen in two years. Really? That's amazing. Yes, we're so excited. <laughs> That's like, great. Okay, we can really relive our history here. That's that's wonderful. So yes. so Pop Hicks was, I mean, it's the quintessential um, Route 66 diner. Would, the, yes. would you agree? Yes. I agree with you. Yeah. I mean, and as somebody who I, I, I've driven, I've never done the drive from Chicago straight through to Santa Monica, which unfortunately is, is near impossible to do anymore. But I have done every leg that you can do at one point or another. And the diners that you run into are, my father was a truck driver. Maybe it's genetic. So mm -hmm. he taught me, um, you always sit at the counter. You mm -hmm. always have a cup of coffee. You listen, right. you talk. And maybe that's what turned me into the person I am today. I don't know. There you go. You can talk. <laughs> But that's that's what it was about, because you would sit at the diner, you would sit at the at the counter and you would hear stories from people all over the country. Many times that was how you learned about other uh, other Why? backgrounds, politics, you know, how other people think. 
Um, and you would have this discourse that I don't think that we have anymore. Um, and it's kind of sad that, that we've lost that. Now we go through the drive through and we go through, you know, trying to get through as quickly back on the highway as quickly as we can. Um, but, but you at the museum, I mean, that's the kind of remembrance that you are able to show the patrons that come in. Yes, right? it is. And we even actually have a Valentine diner on our museum property. <laughs> that we have completely restored. It was a actual operating diner on Route 66 and we, we have restored it to its natural beauty. It's basically just an exhibit property, but people love you know, to look at it and just see how it was back in the day with the diner. So I can't go in and get coffee for a nickel? We, <laughs> no, <laughs> but we, we are actually in the future hoping that we can actually open a diner here on this museum property. Oh, Maybe that'd be not amazing. down the road a few years, but that's what we're wanting to do. Oh, that'd be amazing. Um, so, so as we do our little, our, our, our trip through time, so we're in the fifties, um, and you talk about how now the, the high, the highways going through these small towns are able to, um, service people as they come through the gas stations, pop up the diners, pop up. And then my personal favorite, the roadside attractions pop up, right. um, you know, how do you get somebody to pull over and how do you get someone to, exactly. to stop your place? Do you, do you have anything in the museum that kind of represents that? Yes, we do. The next decade that you enter is the 1960s. And in that room, it is divided into half. The first half to represent the hippie culture on route 66, because this was a time, you know, when, People just traveled Route 66, the hippie culture came into place, the tie-dye clothes, the beads, the decorated Volkswagen buses, which we have one in there that we had fun decorating and getting ready for the exhibit. And then the other half of the room represents family vacations, roadside attractions. Um, and in that room, we actually have a classic car that looks like it's pulled into a roadside park, you know. And that room represents all the different tourist courts and places along Route 66. Um, the movies came into place, you know, the old fashioned, where you take down, make a movie as you went to Disney World in California that became so popular that many families traveled Route 66 to California to see Disney World. So. Oh, yeah. This was also the time when the postcards started getting big. It was um, of what you had seen um the bumper stickers started started popping up the the mystery the mystery holes the mystery uh mm -hmm. places like that um the the jackalope is the, right. the one you hear right. all the time all you know um like said, so people would stop yeah yeah and not all of them were on route 66 but like the big one you know what is what is the thing is one out in arizona that that i still yes. have gone to a few yes. times um why do you think that 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 appeals to people do you, have you ever thought about it? I just think that it was part of the nostalgia of the road. And so many people have, of course, the older people that come in remember. Of course, those are passing now, a lot of those mm. people. Um, but also, it just means a lot. You know, today it is social media all the way, right? Yeah. But then it was what you actually seen along the road or actually saw in your hand. And I think that... That is just a, people love that and they love the different pictures of that time period. And then because the, it was bright, bold and beautiful. Yeah, I think I think there was a mystery to it, too. It was almost like you right. were part of a, a special club that, Very true. you know, you know, we saw we saw this thing in Arizona that no one else saw. We saw this exactly. thing in, in Oklahoma, unless you were there. You weren't, you weren't part of the, you don't have the secret handshake. You didn't actually get to be part of it. Right. And the people um, that come in, you know, that's what they they want to see, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And they ask us continually, you, you know, like a man held up something today. Where's this at? You know? Yeah. <laughs> they love it. <laughs> so, so we, so, so we're in the fifties, the sixties, and then this is, we're starting to see the development of the highways right. and the freeways start the Eisenhower administration. We're That's starting to see right. the investment. Mm -hmm. So what, unfortunately, what starts happening uh -huh. then? Yes. In the 1970s, of course, all the businesses, if they wanted to thrive, they had to move to the interstate, right? And many were not able to. So many of these 
famous places on Route 66 that thrived so much when Route 66 was the main road to travel started closing. They became deserted. The road was at a standstill. No business. So many went out of business and, and you know, just died totally and started, they were boarded up. So this is really a sad time of history on Route 66. And uh, in our 1970s gallery, we actually had, we show the movie Route 66, an American Odyssey. And this really sums up the history of the road. And before we redone the museum, that was the last room of the galleries and then people would enter the gift shop, but they would come out almost crying, so upset. So when we redone the galleries in the, about 12 years ago, we decided that we needed another room after the 1970s to cheer people up before they came into the gift shop. So we added a now and future room, what Route 66 has to offer today. You know, traveling the most famous historic highway in the world. And so in there, we change our exhibits out to different exhibits about every six months. And right now we have a beautiful photo exhibit by Jim Ross and Shelley Graham. And so people are really happy then when they come out to, you know, it's just, they've forgotten about the 1970s and they're ready to shop and be happy. <laughs> so what's your favorite part? You, you have to have a favorite part of the museum. You have to have a favorite exhibit. I know they're like your children and you can't play favorites, but come on. <laughs> I have to admit to you the 1960s. <laughs> Why is that? Because that was my time period as a teenager. So I'm old, as you can tell. Ah. So <laughs> the 1960s, because that was my happy day, you know, so I can really relate to the, all the hippie culture and that. Not that I was a hippie, but uh, I, the mini skirts, the, you know, all of that. Yeah, but that's Long probably true. I would think that would be true with all your guests then. Like you're, you're going to gravitate to the, the, whatever your golden time was in your right. life. They love it. And to be honest, we actually had Paul McCartney come in one time. Oh. And that was pretty exciting. Uh. <laughs> However, he said, please don't give him any recognition. He was traveling Route 66 from Chicago to Santa Monica. Mm -hmm. He did not want to be recognized. He wanted some, he had a classic vehicle. I'll never forget when it pulled in the lot, it had gold wheels on it. Gold. I've never saw one that had pure. Well, that's gold. low key. Uh -huh. if, you don't, if you don't want to be acknowledged, put gold wheels on your car. There you I go. I thought, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. He wanted to be acknowledged, I do believe. Okay. Well. But I'll never forget it because when he came in, I told one of the other girls, he looks like one of the Beatles, you know. It just because that's my time period. And so. He went through the museum, he was a wreck. You could tell he didn't want us to recognize him. But when he came out, he goes, such a lovely museum. And he mm. started buying books. And one of them was about the Beatles or something on Route 66, a book that we had. <laughs> and then I said to the, I said, he looks like one of the Beatles. I said it out loud. And so he told me, I am, but please, please, you know, don't pull everyone in town here. I wanted to so bad though. <laughs> <laughs> did you at least, did, he, did you get a photo with him or something for the museum? Um, no, he got out of there really fast. Oh. I just, I hate everything. I guess I was so much in shock that I, my mind didn't even move right. You know what I mean? Uh, it happens. We all so. just kind of stood there kind of numb. But you know, now when I see him on TV, I feel like I personally know him. But when he got into Amarillo, he had to get completely off the road because people would not leave him alone. Yeah. Yeah, you know, that's oh. he's a different level of right. superstar. He's legendary. Right. So. So. But yes, this well, is my favorite time period. Well, what what brought you to the museum then? What how did you initially get involved and why did you um I, I'm guessing you didn't start as the director. I'm guessing no. that you worked your way up, but what happened? I actually started in nineteen ninety, and this museum here was Western Trails Museum. But I also realized that they, would, they were in the process of trying to develop the Route 66 Museum here in Clinton. And you know, it means an awful lot to me because I grew up on Route 66 between Weatherford and Clinton. Mm -hmm. And I remember when the interstate was being built and Route 66 was slowing down. And so I would, as a child, I'd be in my swing set, you know, swinging and watching the traffic go down Route 66. So it meant a lot to me. And I'd heard about this and an opening came up 
or a historical interpreter at the Western Trails Museum. And since my degree was in history and business slash business, I applied for the job and, and got the position. And then we started in with all the transformation of the fundraising and I was involved in that for this museum and uh, all the exhibits, removing the old exhibits and, and you know, transferring those artifacts back to the owners. And I can remember being out here when the construction was going on and my office was in the back room while they were hammering the building and placing artifacts and I painted the exhibits, which yeah, my life sweat through here for sure. It definitely has. It seems like one thing that I, what's something I find interesting and I always have about, about Route 66 is something that you kind of mentioned about the hippie movement. And then, you know, you have the, the, the families and the, the post-war boom and the getting out on the road. It's, it's a, Route 66 is a very unifying experience. You're, it's, it's almost like a neutral ground because you're on the road. You may have your own reasons. You may have your own background. You may have your own uh, politics or outlook on life or whatever, but it's a unifying experience being out on that road, traveling, seeing whether it's natural sites, the, the, the landscape, the natural landscape, the buildings, it, yes. it, it's like a it's like a place where you can really come together and leave it at the door and really just have this uniquely American experience. Absolutely. You know, mm-hmm. and I, I would hope that when people walk into the museum, you know, that it gets left at the door and it, it really is still about like where we've come from, where we're going, what we're bringing to the table, who we are as human beings, not just who we are as Americans or, or any country when they Absolutely. come in. Absolutely. You know, this is what people share with us, just what you just stated. They do. Yeah, they do. Really? Mm-hmm. They do. What and kind what of does, what kind of things do they share with you? Like what what experiences? Well, they just love to tell you about, you know, here they are, they're doing the Route 66 trip. They started in Chicago and they're going to all the way to Santa Monica. And this is many retired people, but also many families. And They just tell us, oh, this is one of the best road trips we've ever had. Uh, Just learning, you know, about the road and for the younger people. And and our children have enjoyed it. And they're just, they're happy. They're excited. Just excited about the history of Route 66. Do they get off their phones for a couple minutes? They actually do. (laughs) The the young people, yes, they do. Until they take the pictures in the museum. I'm sure that. Yeah, yeah, oh, sure. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) What's your, what, um, what's your, you already said the fate, your favorite exhibit. Um, what's the most popular, like, what are people drawn to when they're, when they're in the museum? The most popular exhibit to the people is the diner, the diner. They love the diner. Really? Uh-huh. Why, also why? in our front room, uh, we call it our wow room. You're supposed to go wow when you enter. <laughs> that's the name of the exhibit room and in there you know it's really highlights route 66 in many ways and we change classic cars they love that too mm. they love that cars that traveled on route 66 especially the beautiful classic big engine cars yeah and we have a friend that has 48 restored classic cars brought back to their natural beauty and he lets us he's gracious enough to let us have a different one in here every six months so we're thankful for that because many people might not want to loan you know their classic car to the museum so but he just trades out so we're very thankful for that and people love that that's pretty much why they come in the museum they'll see that one of the classic cars Mm. and they'll say this must be a fun museum and you know they relate to the fact that this car traveled on route 66 during its heyday so yeah no you don't really I, I don't think i've ever come across a person has looked at a classic car and went humbug no, you know, right. just kind of <laughs> right it's like yay you have to you, know, you have the to teenagers smile. like to borrow these cars for senior oh no. they all want to borrow them. like yeah or like their senior prom and that type of thing so he loans the cars to seniors oh, wow. too oh that's sweet it is so the the hundred year anniversary is coming up Yes, it is. 
Yes. What you guys doing for that? Big party? We will have a big party and we're going to start doing some uh, updating our exhibits. And uh, I'm actually on the Centennial Commission with the Lieutenant Governor. Ooh, and uh, he is promoting Route 66 in Oklahoma. He's for Route 66 all the way is promoting tourists through Oklahoma. Mm. So we're working on uh, raising money to really promote the road for the 100th anniversary in every town along Route 66 in Oklahoma. So it Ooh. should be an exciting, exciting year. So what kind of, I mean, can you share a little bit what kind of promotions you're going to be doing without spilling the beans or... Just making sure that each town really promotes Route 66 in their town. And here in Clinton, Oklahoma, at our museum, we what we are wanting to do is redo our theater, where it's mm -hmm. actually like an outdoor theater inside. We're hoping even to possibly, I don't know if this will take place, it begins, it just actually depends on the funding. We're wanting to open an operating diner. And maybe redo all of our exhibits throughout again because it has been 12. Oops. And um, just every town and also the towns working with us, for example, uh, you know, restoring Pop Hicks, um, the Glancies, uh, the Redland Theater downtown is getting their sign restored, just working on making the downtown area uh, an exciting place for route 66 tourists to visit taking it kind of back in time yeah you really to make people want to stop the, the that's right yeah to really step back into time so it's kind of exciting that I, kind I, of I'm, real exciting yeah i would say there's no kind of about it that's, real exciting <laughs> you know it's 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 something that's true we touched on this earlier it's something that's truly american culture and, Absolutely. you know, while we're a wonderful country of melting pots and, and, and different backgrounds that have come together, there's something about Route 66 that is just so uniquely American. And, and of course, you know, the, the movie, you know, the movie of uh, Route 66, Martin Milner and George Maharis started mm -hmm. the movie. You know, a lot of people, they've heard about that. You know, how oh, movie, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. There's all those, I mean, you've got Baghdad Cafe and you've got, mm -hmm. you know, all of these different road movies that gl glorify it. And it, it goes beyond, like, I think Route 66 has risen to such a level that even things that aren't Route 66 are Route 66. Because You're right, the, absolutely. Absolutely you know, right. It's just, you know, no. You go on a road trip to Vegas and you're not on Route 66, but you I feel know, like but you there's are. There's all the I know all the items. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I know it. So so what's what um what's the absolute top seller in the gift shop? Gotta ask. I would say the absolute top seller is signs. People love the signs. Oh, the metal, the metal signs? The, yes. the replicas. Uh, and we have all types. We have the shield shaped sign and then the historic signs mm -hmm. and every other kind of sign. And many people buy those, of course, for their caves, you know, the men for their man caves, the women oh, yeah. for their areas of the house, and, and they buy a lot of signs. So I would say that's probably our top seller. Do you have, out, out here in California on Route 66, we have um, painted um, emblems on the actual highway, on the road. Um, and... I shouldn't say this, but I am one of the people who have sat on the highway and had my picture exactly. taken in the middle of the road, as exactly. dangerous as it is. And take their chances of getting ran over, yes. Yeah, yeah. I always try and do it in a place where at least we can see for a mile down each way and be careful, but it happens. Do you, do you have that out there? Do you, the... We don't here in Clinton, Oklahoma, and one reason we don't, we have it in one area on Route 66 that uh, passes through Clinton, but that's the only place. And they decided that just that one was so dangerous. Mm, yeah. Uh, people laying on it. Yeah. Know, uh, yeah. I know. Traveled area. You're and giving so me the eye. Not to do that. <laughs> but we are in the process of placing more signs along it here in Clinton to promote it. Um, the city of Clinton has realized that. And I think they're pitching in to pay for that. So that should be helpful. It's like photo ops, photo op spots that are safe. Yes, you're right. And yeah. out here at the museum on the north side patio, we have a very large shield on our patio area. 
Mm-hmm. And so numerous people, of course, that's the first thing they do before they enter is have their picture made on that shield laying down in all positions. And the Harley guys like to roll their Harleys up there as well. <laughs> so things so never right. Change. Those are definite photo ops. They, they are. They are. And, I, and I'm the first to admit that it's not the smartest thing to do. And I, as I get older, I get wiser. And see, but. we thought about, you know, putting more of those along the road through Clinton, but decided it wasn't safe. Yeah. You know, that, that makes sense. So, well, so we've covered the entire history and we've even talked about, we even went in the future a little bit. Is there anything else that we didn't cover that like, that you want to make sure people know about the museum or about, you know, your personal connection or? Yes. I might add that our gift shop here is the largest gift shop is what our visitors tell us. We have one of the biggest variety of items, Mm -hmm. even though the pandemic has halted the sum, (laughs) you know, getting merchandise, but so yeah. many people and many bus tours and many groups wait till they get here to shop. And I just want to tell visitors that we really, really appreciate that. Since we are a state museum, however, how we actually operate here is food missions and gift shop. We only receive 5% overall funding, which, you know, we're very thankful for, yeah. but it is a self-funding museum. And you can, the, the website is Oklahoma RT 66 museum.com. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Uh-huh. Okay. And that there's an online store. Yes, we do so, have an online store as well. Okay. So we'll make sure, we'll make sure that that gets promoted as well. You have my word Thank on that. Thank you so one. much. So, yes. well, I really appreciated the time. It was fun to have a conversation thank you so much it. i really enjoyed it it was so nice to visit with you nice to meet you as well oh thank you pat it's pat smith the director of the oklahoma route 66 museum which is the first state sponsored route 66 museum in the country which is very wow. important um there's museums across the country if you have a chance to visit anyone that's near you do it but definitely if you're in oklahoma stop in and see pat and the diner and all the wonderful artifacts. So whether you're a hippie or a, or a Paul McCartney fan, this is the place to go. So Pat, thank you so much. Thank you time. so much. And get your kids song, Route 66. For the highways of America, which for so many years were an assortment of as many designs and pavements as there were states, are now becoming one big road that can take you anywhere faster, safer, and more directly than ever before. What is this big road? Where is it going? How much has been built? How much is yet to come? These are questions we ask. Certainly traveling the entire system would be a memorable experience, but few of us have the time for such a trip. All rights reserved. Viking Dog 2021.